are you open to embracing the practical side of learning and all it has to offer? Are you someone in business who is always looking for your next assignment or challenge? Do you know how to direct that energy? Put succinctly, do you know who you are in the workplace and how to function effectively? Dr. Travis Fox is the CEO of the Ultimate Business Quest, which is on a mission to help you increase your coin, surge your business, and command your realm. It's an app which reveals helpful and relevant business secrets to help you serve your business and bring it to the next level. Dr. Fox also has a doctorate in psychology and he has some strong opinions about the state of America, its political divide, and how we can fix a broken educational system. Join me for this informative and insightful conversation. I'm Kevin McShan, a lad of this conversation. Dr. Fox, if you're ready, I'll welcome you to the program, and I'm super delighted to be with you uh, this afternoon to talk about the work that you do and everything in between. Great to be with you uh, this afternoon, and thank you so very much for being here. Kevin, thanks for having me on the show, man. I'm excited. So tell me what we're going to jam about. Let's get into it. So, Dr. Fox, I wanted to start today's conversation by asking your definition of effective creativity and how do you think it can be both beneficial in life and in business? Fabulous question. I think there's a big difference and it's something we talk about in the quest. There's a lot of people who fantasize and say, wow, it'd be great if, you know, I could admit the next, you know, megalithic company, the next Amazon, the next Facebook. And that's really just kind of fantasizing. When you do effective creation, you feel the, the creation from, the, uh, from an emotional point of view first, meaning this is an adventure I'm willing to take and I feel compelled to go do it. Then your mind will reorganize itself and you'll start to see a structured plan. At that point, it really becomes the choice. Am I willing to go act on what I care about or do I not really care enough? And I think the biggest gap for most people, Kevin, is <clears throat> the difference between, gee, it'd be nice if, and I really care about that. Because if we start caring about something, we're compelled to think about it. And the more we think about it, then we'll do something about it. But if, it, if it'd be nice that, we're really just daydreaming and going, well, you know, if it falls out of the sky, then I'll take it. But I really don't care enough to think about it, focus on it, and then act on it. So I think that's the biggest difference. And that's what's going to make creative, um, uh, effective creative uh, creation, excuse me, really bring your dreams to fruition. That's what we've done over here. Absolutely. And Dr. Fox, I know that you have a doctorate in psychology, so I'm wondering your thoughts on the psychology of America and its people and the direction the country is headed today. Would you uh, characterize the current psychology of, of America at? Yeah, that's a really powerful question, Kevin. Uh, my personal observation is we're being invited to divide ourselves again. And, and to create the disconnectedness that we've enjoyed for the better part of you know, three to four decades since our, our last major external conflict going all the way back to the early 80s. I think more than ever, though, if we really go past all the top end psychology, the top end media, the top end day to day bombardment of these continued fear based concepts, I think all of us really are looking for something to connect with that is bigger than ourselves. We kind of got some of that when we saw the first you know, manned space flight that went up with Jeff Bezos. We went, wow, okay, we're really looking at what it takes as a species, not just a country, but as a species 
to now look at um, terrestrializing other uh, planetary bodies, i.e. Mars or Venus or the moon. And so when we look for something bigger than ourselves, it becomes almost impossible to not care about your fellow man and woman. And I think this goes back to the same fundamental element, caring. We've spent so much time not connected in the way that we're, we've been doing for the better part of you know, six centuries now in this last, through this pandemic, that I think care is the number one issue. And I'm not talking about, gee, just I just care about things because they're nice. I'm talking about genuine bona fide caring. Hey, I care about my neighbor because my neighbor li lives next door to me, or I care about what happens to the country because we're a part of it. I care about what happens to the uh, earth in and of itself because that's the legacy we leave to our children. And when we stop caring about things, we as human beings you know, really kind of move into what we call the profane archetypes. And the, and the profane archetypes are more destructive, i.e., you know, becoming barbarians or really becoming, you know, vampiric and energy and drains with each other as opposed to really working together and, and collaborating. So for me, I think this is a wonderful opportunity and it's something that we're on the front lines of is about really caring again and connecting to something bigger than ourselves. And when we do that as a country, and we've seen this time and time again as a country, everybody comes together. It doesn't matter race, creed, gender, sexual orientation, all that goes out the freaking door. What would be really, op uh, I think, optimal is we stop doing it reactively, meaning after the after something consequential has occurred, and we do it proactively. We now have that in the palm of our hands as we the people. It just now re requires a unifying force. Uh, Dr. Falk, how do you think from a psychological uh, standpoint we can sort of bridge the uh, current societal divide we're currently experiencing? Uh, I think it's going to boil down a couple of things. <clears throat> One, it's an economic divide that's the biggest challenge. We still have, you know, the 1% of the 1%, and that's great. And then there's the 99%. Now, if you look throughout history, that has been one of the most common causes for conflict in multiple countries, not just the United States. And we're looking about, because that goes into a survival mechanism. We as human beings obviously have a need to survive and thrive and then pass it on to the next generation. In our current state, you know, the economic driver is becoming challenging, especially you know, in this quasi post pandemic. And I think that really when we start looking from a space of what can we do together? And I'll use a metaphor, you know, back when America was first being built, as an example, there used to be what was called a barn raising. You know, everybody in town would come together and build this barn for their neighbor. And then it would just go around town. So everybody felt connected to their neighbor because I put up that two by four. I helped, you know, shield that roof. And I did it not because I was getting paid. I did it because it was the betterment of my community. And I knew that I would get it in return. And it builds the bonds of trust that go beyond race or creed or economics. It's about community. And I think the biggest fundamental challenge is our communities have been really stretched and in some cases obliterated. And really, when we look at the economic and the community, you put those two together, we become one of the most powerful countries on the, on the planet again, not because of our money and our connectivity, because of the people. And that's really the trick, is my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Dr. Fox, I know that you have uh, an opinion on how we want more and more as a people and a way to absorb more. So I, I'm curious if you could sh share a little bit about that with me this afternoon. Yeah, it's a great, man, your questions are phenomenal, Kevin. <laughs> I, I wish all my podcasts said these questions. These are great questions because they got meat on the bone, man. Thank you. Here's a, here's a response to that. When we look at our educational system, which is where most of our focus tends to be right now in our company, we don't teach our kids anymore. We teach our kids to take tests so that our tax dollars fund these schools and the teachers really are glorified in a lot of ways you know, babysitting or uh, babysitting or, or crowd control. They're not given the freedom to teach like they did, you know, back when my, in my day, because, you know, I'm 50 plus now. And so we look at these, our children coming out, highly educated, but knowledge application, dumb. They don't know how to do a lease. They don't know how to buy a car. They don't even know how to balance a checkbook because they believe it's all done digitally for them. And so the consequences of that becomes, who cares? We're back to caring again. And so when we look at these things, it's like, well, wait a minute, why don't we start with actually educating ourselves on what are the survival skills we really need? And when you do that, it stimulates naturally creativity. 
Now we're not constantly in survival mode because in survival mode, we're always looking for more, more money, more food, more housing, more uh, cheaper gas. We're constantly on this search and we come from a place of feeling like we're not good enough. We feel like we have a lacking all the time and we move into competition mode instead of going to my brother, Kevin, and saying, brother, Kevin, hey, help me with this because this is your expertise. That's that wizard brain of yours. Can you run this through that mind of yours and help me? Instead, we turn competitive. And then when we, once we turn competitive, then we can segregate a community based on gender, sexual orientation, race, creed, socioeconomic, uh, socio-demographic. We can segregate. And the moment we're segregated, we automatically turn into that famous book, Lord of the Flies, right? We segregate, we get into competition mode, and bang, wash, rinse, and repeat. And we can watch this happen over the last six centuries of history where every great society has done the exact same pattern and ended in the same result. It's like, isn't it time we actually change some of the model? And now's that time to do it with we as the people. Yeah. Do you struggle at work with the concept of either quitting or committing to seeing an initiative or task through? Well, Dr. Fox outlines his seven fears when it comes to either quitting or committing. Quest, one of the first things we do is we take in these big reality blocks that most people face, the fear of success, the fear of failure, fear of public speaking, you know, the fear of good health and taking care of myself as a priority, the fear of abandonment, the fear of not good enough. And we've addressed these in a way, and it's a gamified way and in a fantasy realm. Here's why. And it goes back to one of your previous questions. When I take you to your imagination, you're unlimited. You're, you're ultra powerful, you're superhuman, and you're not afraid. When I put you in your reality, all of those things come to bear because our mind then says, well, based on our experience of the past, this is what's going to happen. But in the fantasy gamified realm, you have no frame of reference. So now your creativity is open, you're fearless, you actually are willing to create, you're willing to cooperate with those around you. So when you look at the top seven fears, they're really based on our shutting down of our emotional caring or what we call the EC formula. And we actually teach you that EC formula in the quest and it's fun because here's the truth, Kev. Nobody's having fun anymore. Everyone's too serious. Everyone's pissed off all the time. Everyone's That's political. an understatement, right? Right? <laughs> Nobody's having fun. And I'm like, time out. Let me clue you in, guys. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I can add. Everybody's getting off the planet the same, broke and dead. The question is, do we really live? And to quote the great, the great Alan Watts, life doesn't define death. Death defines our life because death is eminent and life is a choice. And so as we move away from caring and we move away from having fun, because fun, you, can, you have tons of it. You can never run out of fun. You already know how to do it. No one needs to teach anyone how to have fun. Three, you can call it on command anytime, anywhere, any place, whether you have a nickel in your pocket or five billion. And four, it's infectious. Everybody wants to go on an adventure. Everybody wants to have fun. So until we start having fun, which is what the quest is all about, we take that in the game world and we put it into your reality. And then your brain subconsciously can't tell the difference between what's real and what's fantasy. To it, it's one and the same. And now those seven fears you rewire yourself all on your own. And then you start to understand this law of attraction, this law of manifestation is really about fun because when you care, you'll go have fun with it. And when you're having fun with it, those four things apply and now we start to change. Now we go back to the quit and the commit. Many of us will talk about, you know what, Kev? I'm committed to making a billion dollar company. Okay, how are you gonna do it? I have no idea. Cool. So we've, we quit before we ever committed. And the reason that we do that is a four level structure deep, but the simplest of answers is we know based on what our brain tells us that most likely it's going to fail. However, that has nothing to do with who you are. That's just an experience that taught you how to do it better, more efficiently and with less waste and had fun to it. So when you look at a quit before a commit model, most of us really quit and stop on ourselves before we ever really commit it. And we get to get to look at commitment. And so one of the things you learn archetypally is you learn how to access 
the heart of yourself, which is really your driver. It's like an engine, right? Because when you care and your, your heart's in it, your passion starts to fire. When your passion starts to fire, that wizard brain here starts to think about, how am I going to make this work? What's this going to be like? This is going to be, and you're creating. And then from there, now all of a sudden, the car that is your business, the car that is your passion, the car that is your, your momentum and your calling drives. Now you get to hold on for the ride and now you're steering it based on what's down here in your guts commonly called your instinct, or in our language, the jester, the being part of you that is bigger than this part of this thing we call human, that's called Kevin, and that's called Travis. You can call that spirit, chi, soul, whatever words you want. We call that the architect, because that's the part of you that is the deep architecture that understands you're here for a big purpose. You're here to ignite, to ignite and release that passion. You are here to release that brilliant wizard brain of yours. And you are definitely here to be part of this collective that we call planet Earth. And we can't do it without you. What, we, what we're looking for is for all of us to finally get that order and correctness and move away from the old formula that you and I were taught, which is mind, body, spirit. Because the problem with that formula is mind can't solve itself. So the moment you start taking mind to solve itself, we literally go a little bit goofy and we stay awake at night and we stare at the ceiling fan trying to figure out mind and against itself and it drives us nuts. It's time we flip everything upside down and put it in the right order, which is called the EC formula. And that's feeling and then your body feels it automatically and you start moving differently, energetically you're different. You start architecting how you speak because everything's now in alignment and then that brain of yours finally makes you have fun and you're looking through the world's eyes from fantasy and reality simultaneously as how do I make this fun? Because if I ask you that question, as opposed to, uh, hey, Kevin, I want you to, you know, tell me how to solve the economic problem. You're going to go, oh my God. Bleh. But if I said, well, what if we look at the economic thing as a game and we make it fun? Could you tell me how to make it fun? You could do that automatically and all you do is access it and then you'll see it differently. And that changes how we see the world and that changes how we see each other and we changes how we see ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And Dr. Fox, uh, before this started, you told me that you've been working all summer as a part of the ultimate business quest and the work that you're doing in that endeavor. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, if you could share more about the ultimate business quest and what, what's it all about. Absolutely. So the ultimate business quest is a 31 year journey for myself and 25 plus years for my fellow quest master teachers. And the whole concept was how come business isn't fun anymore? How come we make it so difficult, so laborious, so scary? So it's not. All of us wanted to be in business, whether you're a CEO, whether you're a coach, a teacher, a facilitator, an entrepreneur, an influencer. We got into it for one base reason. That base reason is we wanted to go on an adventure and we wanted our freedom. And our freedom means our time, freedom means our money, and freedom means to create the way that we wanted to create without the constructs of a corporation telling us what to do. So the quest for us was, well, what if we took it in a way that put it in an app so that you could get it 24 hours a day, we made it an adventure. Three, we gave you all the tools to either start, grow, or expand your business, your culture, face all the issues that we truly face in business, but shift how you did it and do it a thing we call thematic learning. And here we are. So as we released it over the summer, we went through the beta runs in five different countries to make sure that it worked with people. And it's extraordinary. And now it's getting even bigger. And if I may be so bold, Kevin, right here on, on your show, and thanks again for having me on it, it's now, we're now uh, a part of a television show that's going to make it even bigger called America's Real Deal. So it's America's Real Deal is the ultimate business quest to go from founder to funding to fortune. So you can start investing in yourself and investing in real companies because it's time we the people are able to invest in companies way before the institutions get to them, way before they go public, and way before they do their IPO, because that's how we bridge the gap from the 1% to the 99%. And the SEC has changed that for us a couple of years back with the 506 ruling so we can do crowd equity funding, but do it above board. So everybody can see what you're investing in. And whether you have $100 or you have a million dollars, you can get involved in these companies. And now we're doing it together. And that barn raising that I was talking about a moment ago comes together. And the quest is out front so that everybody can go through it. Whether again, whether you have $100 to your name or you have a million dollars to your name, this app is for everybody. 
Well, thanks for sharing that. That sounds like a ultra cool uh, endeavor. So I want to I wish you the best of luck with that for sure, Dr. Fox. And I'm Thank you. curious to get your thoughts on your definition of how you uh, maximize growth and seize the opportunity for personal development. How do you uh, define that both personally and professionally? That's a great question. And what I define it radically, now if you had asked me that 20 years ago, Kevin, I would have given you a much more traditional clinical answer. But in my own journey and watching and working with companies and corporate cultures and developing them over time, one of the things I've learned is, I think the biggest challenge we all face is we have a belief that says, you've got to be better. You've got to be more. You've got, you're not good enough. And you've got to go find your passion. You've got to find your purpose. You've got to find your soulmate. You got to do all these things. Here's the problem. We don't have a freaking map. How the heck do we do it? So we wander around most of our lives, beating our head against the wall, thinking that we're grinding and expecting that wall to become a door and it never does. And then what happens is we send ourselves down into the pit of despair and to the pit of excuses and we, we stop caring. We stop giving a flip. And guess what happens when you stop caring? Your body starts to deteriorate. You don't take care of yourself. This thing starts to get into all kinds of wanderings. Then your heart stops to not be really interested. And you're not passionate anymore. So when you really look at the, the philosophy of this whole experience, the, the, the entire thing is about, well, wait a minute. We've done it this way for 6,000 years. We got a lot of data. Yeah, there's been success, sure. But the greater componency is failure because it's set up that way. Because we teach our kids, you're educated, but now you get to go to the school of hard knocks, Kevin, and get the crap kicked out of you for the next 20 years. And if you survive that, you might just get to retire for 10 or 15 years when you're 65 or 70. Then you can go travel, enjoy the world, da, 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 da. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I've never agreed with that in my entire life, and I never will. And the quest of my life and my fellow quest masters is to go time out. We are in the theme park of self-transformation. You can become anything you want to become, not just in the United States, period, here on planet Earth. However, we have this little thing called a wizard brain. And when it's programmed to say that the brain itself has to figure itself out, mind and mind, we set ourselves up for insanity, for failure, not good enough, depression, you name it, which explains why we have a high divorce rate, which explains why we have a lot of, you know, some 82% of entrepreneurs or businesses fail in their first year because either A, can't get enough money, there we go to that 1%, 99% again. Or two, there's internal conflict, which means we're not putting our teams together and allowing the specialization of talent. For example, Kevin's a super wizard. Well, that means he's got a brilliant brain in there and that brain can process a boatload of information. Well, okay, so instead of you trying to be a wizard, Kevin's the wizard. You're over here gonna be the warrior or you're gonna be the bard, you're gonna be the jester. And you learn to balance by, by admiring and allowing that person to be in their mastership. And it's not about you being a better you anymore, Kevin. That's the fundamental philosophy of the quest. How can you be a better you? Because deep down inside, you're amazing. You've always been amazing. But we've been programmed to believe we're not. Programmed that we gotta go find, 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 find because we have all these missing pieces. Here's the truth. They're not missing. They're just scattered all over in your emotional body and that brain of yours. And we need to reassemble the beautiful puzzle that you are and go on the quest to rescue your heart from mediocrity because mediocrity is the death of creativity. It is the death of economic fortune. It is the death of your relationship. And it is the last thing you want to pass on as a parent to your children. Hey, go be mediocre. Don't shoot for the stars. Play it safe. Are you nuts? We're all getting off the planet the same, broken, dead. It's about living your butt off and shining when you peel all of that stuff off of you, all of that shame and that guilt and not good enough and I'll never get there. You peel it off, there's this amazing being that's already there, that's already connected to everything. It's impossible not to be. But we do is we take it out of the ethereal realm and we put it into reality and go, you connected to everything and you start to see the world in a different place and you stop trying to be a better you. You finally just freaking be you.
Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Fox. You know, one uh, uh, philosophy that I live my life by is that inclusion is the gateway to independence. And certainly, uh, I shared with you that I um, have a cerebral palsy, and I know that you're a, a, a special needs parent yourself. So I, I believe that inclusion for everyone is the key to diversity as well. So. Absolutely. And not only that, I mean, this is it. Oh, I, I'm, I'm like become your biggest fan right now because you're the first person in a long time that can get it. Not and your cerebral, cerebral palsy just is a gateway for people to stop judging and go, excuse me, if you actually see the being, who cares? Because we all have some sort of affliction. It may not be as overt, but we have the affliction of depression. We have the affliction of not good enough. We have the affliction of shame. We have the affliction of guilt. And those, my friend, I believe are deep more powerful killers of spirit and heart and passion than just about anything else that you'd see on the surface level. And it's not just inclusion. Remember something, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we all leave the spacesuit behind, meaning the body. It got, and if you don't believe me, just go hang out the local mortuary and you're going to find out the body stays behind. <laughs> There's no way around it. Last I checked, the only truth on this planet is you ain't getting off this planet alive. Everything else is a story and an adventure. So it's not just occlusion. And like, yes, like may attract like. That's true. But like doesn't learn from like. Like learns from unlike. So if I want to learn something, I need to be around something that's unlike what I'm used to. For example, I need to be around a Kevin. I need to learn what that's like because I don't have a frame of personal reference. My, my field is with autism and Asperger's. Okay, but I need to be around a Kevin. I need that wizard brain of his. He's developed other skills during this process that we call CP. He's developed them. And that spirit's still in there. And I'm not blowing sunshine up your skirt. That's how I actually work. I'm going time out. I don't care what your age is, your creed is, your gender is, sexual orientation, married, divorced. I don't care what country you are. What I care about is do you care? Are you ready to go on the adventure of a lifetime? And are you willing to play the part that is most dynamic to you and learn from unlike yourself? If you do that, man, that's the best way to go conquer any mountain and go any adventure because that's what we all really want to do. We want to turn and go, Kevin's the wizard. Wizard, you're up. Go do your magic thing. We're going to sit back and watch. You got this. And now we're not threatened. In fact, we're champions. We champion ourselves. We champion our friends. We champion our, our fellow teammates because we're not afraid. Because now we understand everybody's got their mastership and we honor it. When you do that, now the world becomes fun again. And Dr. Fox, this is a quick follow-up. I'm, I'm curious to know what your definition of full inclusion is for uh, people of all abilities. Exactly what I said, coming from having been in the autistic space now for 20 years, and my greatest teacher hat was, uh, was and is my autistic son, who's now 19. And the best lesson that I could prove that to you on is a quick story where when he was seven years old, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was fall. So, you know, everybody rakes the leaves and we make a big pile because why? We're all going to jump in the leaves and make a big unpile and we're going to pile them again and we play in the leaves. Not Corey. Corey did it a very different way. And I sat and I watched. And he went over and he grabbed these two leaves. And Kevin, he stared at him for what, in my world, seemed like forever. I'm like, what is he doing with these two leaves? I mean, how long can you stare at a leaf? I mean, all this stuff was going through my head. But I was at least in tune enough to be quiet and not interfere just because I'm the parent. And then I watched him take these two leaves and then just slowly start to crunch them with such diligence and such focus and such presence that he started to, he started to feel bliss. And as you know, autistics, they do a thing called modulation when they get super excited or frustrated. And he started to flap and he was modulating. And I'm sitting back watching him going, wait a minute. Uh, I've never been that happy about anything in my life, much less crushing two leaves. And I started to bawl. I started crying because I realized without him ever saying a word, without him ever going, dad, let me teach you because I'm, I'm this and I'm that and your dad and that, whatever. Without ever saying a word, he taught me that I didn't know the difference between happiness and bliss. I've been happy in my life and I've had a lot of happy experiences. I tend to be fairly happy, but I'd never known true bliss. And just by showing that, which is where my tears came from, I learned one of the most powerful lessons, which impacted my career. You know, now we are several years later, now 12 years later, impacted my career going time out. You know, we chase happiness like a drug. 
and it moves like a drug. One moment we're happy, the next moment we're not. Next moment we're happy. But bliss comes from a deeper understanding of being connected and choosing to be fully present with that experience, with that person. So inclusion comes from looking at the blissful experience and asking the most simple, basic, yet most powerful question you'll ever ask. How do we make this fun together? So if I said, Kevin, I want you to come on this quest with me. Only thing I'm going to ask is, how are we going to make it fun? What's fun for you? Because I don't know what's fun for you and you don't know what's fun for me. But if I ask, you'll tell me because it's free and it's unlimited and it can't be taken from you. So there's no competition. Now it's okay. This is how he likes to have fun. Maybe I've never had that kind of fun. I've never taken the time to crush leaves. But now I, when I see leaves, I am forever changed by that moment of how Corey chose to have fun. So I go, Kevin, how do you have fun? So every person in our team and every person we engage with, every company we engage with, everything that we do, it's always asking the same question. How does that become fun? And that invites that little kid-like wizard brain that we all have to wake up and go, okay, I can make it fun if we do this. And we go, awesome, take me on that adventure. And now we're all included because we all agree to the same thing, regardless of race, creed, economic, political, cultural, religious. It all goes out the door because fun is the one thing we all agree on universally. We all want to have fun in an adventure before we leave the planet. Absolutely. And Dr. Fox, how do you define fun personally? Oh, me? Breathing. <laughs> Breathing. And, and matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, one of our quest masters, her name is Michelle Everhart. She also happens to be the CEO of the company now. And she put it in a, really in a powerful sentence. And I share it with you and all of your audience, if I may. And that is fear is simply excitement without breathing. Because when we get scared of things, whether it's emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual, we actually stop breathing. And yet if we all believe what we believe, no matter what dogma you subscribe to, that life began with breath, life, or if we go Japanese style where my influence is, Bushido, life in every breath. We are literally breathing life into ourselves every breath that we take, and we are breathing life in as we expel our breath out but when we get scared we have this little thing that happens as you know called fight or flight even when there's not a real bona fide threat it's often up here what we do is we go <clears throat> and we stop breathing but we forget that our subconscious is still observing and taking in all the information internally and externally while we stop breathing and it writes right into our subconscious and we constantly do that we say things like oh life is about the moments that take your breath away no, it's not. It's about the moments that put breath into you that makes you remember that you're alive. And so it's about learning to breathe again, so much so that we're so convinced and have so much evidence going all the way back to you know ancient China in the Qigong series. We actually brought Sifu John Goff in and said, teach us how to breathe in these business situations. Teach us how to breathe in a, in a business meeting. Teach us how to breathe when we do a sales person. Teach us how to breathe when we're talking to our family so we can breathe life into what we want and stop sucking the air out of what we don't want and then constantly be in a fear-based mentality. So when you look at it, it really about fun is about just breathing and really being present because we're so busy trying to conquer fear. You're not going to conquer it. It's hardwired into our system. But what you are going to do is you're going to use it because the beautiful creator that you are, the beautiful being that you are, can literally breathe life into excitement. And to your body, fear and excitement feel almost identical. The major difference is being consciously aware enough to breathe into it. And now all of a sudden that fear will transform into excitement and excitement becomes fun. And what becomes fun, now all of a sudden we are literally rewriting our own history psychologically, as a community, as a country, and as a species, but we do it in a fun way. So it's not scary. We don't have to go down these deep, dark rabbit holes. We don't have to sit on the mountain for 15 years and shave our head and say that we're devoted to something. Although that's fun too, but we can do it in a fun way that includes everyone because everyone has to breathe. Yeah, absolutely. And Dr. Fox, my Final question for you is, I'm, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to how you want your uh, personal or professional legacy uh, to be defined, and if people want to get connected with you, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I will put this out here because I believe in, in asking for help. What's something I was not very good at and when I was 
Dr. Fox full time when I was young and thought I knew everything. I realized I don't know squat. I know that I don't know. And I just want to have fun with whatever that is. And I always look to make it fun. We are on a quest right now through the ultimate business quest and America, America's real deal is to change the educational system back into a learning system so that we can truly create the next generation, the next generation as a cohesion. The way that we want to do that is we want to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Not because we want the award and you go, look how great we are. It's because that's the standard of global change now. When you win a Nobel Peace Prize, you have affected the entire species. We are on a mad quest to do that. If that affects you, if that makes your body tingle, if listening to Kevin's show makes you go heebie-jeebies and you get the hair in the back of your neck, answer the call. The way that you do that, you go to your Apple store, you go to your Google store, and you type in UBQ or Ultimate Business Quest. Type it in. Take the quest. It's got 25 hours, all the templates that you need, and you're going to do it in story form. Archetypally, conquer your fears in a way that makes them assimilated, that you can use them, like we said. And ultimately, at the end of the quest, you can apply your company, your vision, your dream to get on America's Real Deal. And what makes America's Real Deal so unique, Kevin, is the, the celebrity judges and mentors, they're not the ones that are allowed to invest in the company. The audience is the only one that's allowed to invest in the company. And that allows us to get into these companies early. We do it together. The celebrity mentors compete to help that company see who grows the most throughout the season. And that's how they get their reward. But the deal is we the people. Because the 1% already know how to invest. 1% get to see all these beautiful companies and ideas and creativities. And they gobble them up. By the time we the people get to it, we've missed that opportunity to have a 20x, 30x, or 100x return on something that we were a part of in the beginning. America's Real Deal is changing that now. So we stopped trading and we started investing again because if we don't start investing that way, we are in deep, deep caca. I don't need to tell anybody that. You can figure that one out on your own. So between those things, our quest is to get that Nobel Peace Prize, make the impact and leave the legacy that is the quest for the next generation that's upcoming and let them quest on. Let them continue to take these skills and use them in a fun way. And let's start working together because man, it's a whole lot more fun when you're on the top of the mountain with a group of people that you've been journeying with when you're standing there by yourself. When they say it's lonely at the top, it is, it sucks. Because all you wanna do is go back down. So why not bring a whole bunch of friends with you and now you have the story and the adventure of a lifetime. Yeah, Dr. Fox, uh, one of the things I live by is that Collaboration is the, one of the roots uh, to success because you can't get to the top of the mountain all by yourself. And when you collaborate with others that have a like-minded purpose, you get there a lot faster. Amen. And it's more fun on the way up because we're telling stories, we're laughing, we're joking. And when we get to that top of that mountain, we don't have to worry about going back down. We now decide, hey, we're going to go hang out in this valley on the other side for a while. And then as a group, we, we pick out which adventure we're going to go on. And now you start to create the legacy that is your life, the story of your life, the adventure of who you are. And that's how we've been teaching our generations for pretty much six centuries as opposed to the last, you know, really 50 years where we're starting to rely more and more on technology. We got to pass that down. That is an art that is a little bit lost. It's not gone. It's just lost. We just need to put the pieces back together again. And that's part of what the quest helps you do. But it does it in a fun role-playing kind of way. Fantastic, Dr. Fox. You know, I really enjoyed our mm -hmm. time together this afternoon. And I want to thank you for your insights, perspectives, and opinions. It's Thanks, most man. appreciated. And I want to thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you, man. Thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for giving me the platform and thanks for letting me be on your show. I really appreciate it, sir. You're fantastic questions for real. I've got other people I could go, you need to get on this guy's show because he asked really quality questions. Thank you. Well, yeah, you're welcome, Dr. Buck. I'm always interested in engaging in com conversation. So I want to thank you for the time and for the generous words. It's most appreciated. Thank you, sir.